Lord is here and his spirit is with us. And Lord, we pray that you would enlarge our hearts and our capacity, Lord, to hear and receive from you this evening your word. That that word, Lord God, would take deep, deep root within us. That that word, Lord God, would shape us and shape your church. And that that word, Lord God, would go out then into our communities to transform them. But Lord, would you come and first of all transform us in the very depths of who we are, we pray. Thank you for Greg. Put your spirit upon him afresh, we pray, as he brings your word to us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Greg, can I say again that you're very, very welcome to Down Dremore, very, very welcome here this evening, and I hand over to you. Great. Thank you, Bishop David. And it's so good to be here, so good to be uh, back in the Belfast area. I was out springtime, I think I was out here springtime uh, for three days and met a number of people then. And so it's wonderful to be back for this extended time. Uh, uh, here, I came here a few days ago and I'm here throughout the month of September for a month of uh, what is going to be mission. And it's fantastic to be able to speak at this year's Bible Week, Bible Week uh, 2023. And as you can see from the screen, the theme that we're going to be thinking about over these next four nights, Tuesday night, tonight, Wednesday night, uh, Thursday night, and Friday night, is true conversion. And we're going to be doing uh, four different studies uh, in the first chapter of Paul's epistle to the Colossians. Uh, first, before we go there, a little bit about me. This is my uh, family, the tribe that I've left uh, behind. My two daughters, uh, they're on, uh, my, on my right, Anastasia, uh, who's 12. Uh, she was born, at, uh, for those Greek scholars among you, uh, she was born at uh, Easter time, Anastasia, Greek for resurrection. And Trinity, underneath, she wasn't born on Trinity Sunday, we just like the name. And um, and when she was a little girl, she used, we used to go past things like Trinity College, Dublin, you know, all these things named after Trinity. When she was a little girl, she'd go, Daddy, me, me, me. We'd say, no, no, you're just named after. You're named after him. And uh, so her name's Trinity Isabella, which means dedicated to the God who is Trinity. He's the only God we've got. So that's uh, my two. And uh, that's my wife there, Tammy. Tammy uh, is a medical doctor. And I was just saying to Bishop David and uh, Hillary, I'm, I'm nagged constantly about keeping in health. She's a fitness freak. Well, I suppose that goes with her job, doesn't it? She, you know, when she's, she's coming to visit uh, soon with my two girls, and she'll be out at seven in the morning uh, running. And she's always uh, nagging me and badgering me uh, to get healthy. You know, kind of um, at that stage of life, I'm at that stage of life, uh, you know, middle age, uh, when uh, your broad mind and your narrow waist change places. And uh, so she's often saying to me, you know, darling, get in shape, and I tell her round is a shape, um, it doesn't seem to uh, wash very much, uh, but anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's my tribe, and uh, uh, let me give you a menu, if we can just flick on John, the one after uh, that, true conversion, here's the menu of where we're going, if we can click on to the next slide, tonight, Tuesday the 29th, there it is, a change of address, uh, just two verses, uh, two verses of the first chapter of Colossians. Uh, but there's, as so often with Holy Scripture, uh, there literally is so much uh, content, theological content, in just these uh, two verses. We're going to come to in a few moments. Uh, then tomorrow night, Wednesday, uh, conversion to a cause. Uh, Thursday night, conversion to Christ. And uh, Friday night, conversion to a community. So that's a, a, a roadmap of we, where we are going to be going uh, on the different evenings. And tonight, starting off with these two verses that we just had read to us, a change of address, Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And it starts off, Paul starts off his epistle in characteristic Pauline form, introducing himself. Paul, he says, an apostle, apostolos, it's the Greek word for sent, one who is sent uh, of Christ Jesus, the saving king, the king who saves Christos, uh, Jesu, the saving king, by the will of God. One of the overarching themes for Paul is that God is king. God is sovereign. 
Um, and uh, it's also from Timothy, our brother, who was a co-worker with Paul. And then he says this, verse 2, he said, he, he addresses uh, his readers uh, like this. He says, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. And again, in characteristic Pauline form, he goes, grace and peace to you from God our Father. So Paul introduces himself as the author of this epistle, and he's writing to Colossae. The year is around AD 60, AD 61, something like that. And Paul is writing to a place almost certainly that he'd never been. Colossae was considered something of an insignificant town within Asia Minor. So how come there's a church there at all that Paul finds himself as apostle to the Gentiles? How, how can he find himself writing to this small town fledgling church at all? Well, many scholars uh, think that this church came about because of the revival that happened during Paul's Ephesian mission in the, in the Acts of the Apostles. We read about Paul's in, Paul in Ephesus, which was some 60 miles uh, away, and many people uh, were radically converted to Jesus Christ then. And it seems in all probability that among them was a bloke called Epaphras, and Epaphras quite likely was a native of Colossae, and so he took the gospel ablaze with the love of Christ. Epaphras took the gospel to his native town, Colossae, and he started a church. Perhaps it started in his home and uh, grew to be a faith community there in Ephesus. So Paul is writing to this fledgling church. And what is his purpose? There's often a purpose with each of Paul's epistles. Well, it seems here uh, one of his primary purposes is to refute error. It seems that false teaching had already begun to creep into this fledgling uh, church. Um, I uh, saw the title of a, a book by uh, a well-known Orthodox American uh, bishop the other day called The Cruelty of Heresy. Heresy, of course, is false teaching. And sometimes we tolerate uh, false teaching. In our modern context, we were confused very often as to what is uh, false teaching and what is orthodox, what is true. Uh, well, this, this bishop, Fitz, uh, uh, Fitzwilliam Allison, was correct. The cruelty of heresy. Heresy is cruel. False teaching is cruel because it impedes our spiritual growth and actually can do great damage to individuals and indeed the body of Christ. So Paul is not embarrassed about warning against error that seems to be creeping into the church. And what are his mega themes? Well, I guess some of his mega themes tie in with uh, a purpose in refuting error. Because very often the best way to, uh, to, to, to spot a, uh, a counterfeit is to familiarize yourself with the real thing. We've all heard that, haven't we, in terms of banknotes. There are bank tellers, and part of their training uh, certainly used to be uh, to spot um, forged uh, bills, um, pound notes, 10 pound notes, whatever they are, uh, wasn't to study the forgeries, but to so acquaint themselves with uh, real, the real thing, re uh, the real sterling, that they could spot a forgery a mile off. So not surprisingly, Paul's modus operandi in refuting error partly is to proclaim the truth. And so what are his mega themes? Uh, well, there are four mega themes, perhaps, uh, throughout the whole of this epistle, which is all four chapters uh, of his letter to uh, Colossae. And the first one is the life of being a Christian disciple. The second is the glorious gospel. The third is the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ. Um, these are the different uh, themes that Paul talks about. And the fourth is the people of God, namely the church. And those uh, four areas were under attack in differing ways by some of these false teachers. So Paul proclaims the truth about these four particular areas. Another theme, many commentators note, that's uh, 
quite unique to Paul's letter to the Colossians, is the theme of hope Paul uses in uh, this epistle, his, 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 his phrase that Christ is the hope of glory. And that's perhaps all the more surprising uh, when we realize that Paul was writing from prison. So he could be forgiven for not having hope, couldn't he? He could be forgiven for being hopeless. I've worked in a prison years ago after my curacy as a padre, and I can assure you that that was one of the most hopeless contexts that I've ever had to work. And yet Paul is in prison, and yet he has hope. I don't know whether you've come across the, uh, the, the phrase that you know, people use sometimes. I'm sure they use it here. They do back in England. Uh, when you ask someone, how are they? And sometimes uh, people's response is, oh, not bad under the circumstances. And uh, sometimes uh, when someone, people say that to me, I say to them, well, whatever made you think you had to be under the circumstances? And if you're a Christian, you're over the circumstances. Um, elsewhere, the Apostle Paul says that Jesus Christ has made us more than conquerors. The Greek word is hyperkonomen. We're called to uh, live the Christian life as those who have a hope, even in the midst of adversity, uh, when things are going wrong. So hope, that's one of the glorious uh, themes. And more about that tomorrow night. We're thinking particularly about that theme uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening. And so uh, what we're thinking about uh, today then is the first of those four mega themes, which is living the life of a Christian disciple. Uh, tomorrow we're thinking of what it means uh, to be wedded to uh, the cause. That's the cause of, of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Uh, the night after we're thinking about uh, conversion to Christ. Think about the, uh, the supremacy and the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then on the final night, on Friday night, we're thinking about the imperative of being part of God's new society, the, the people of faith, namely the church. But we're thinking tonight about what it means to be a Christian disciple. I've come to the conclusion, having been ordained for, I think, 27 years now this year, that there really is a paucity of authentic, radical Christian discipleship in the body of Christ. There's also a paucity of, of mission as well. I'd say that as an evangelist. Sometimes we're not very good at reaching out and bringing people to Christ. But even when people come to Christ, even when people are added to this uh, new community, the church, we're not good sometimes at discipling people, of coaching people, and treating people as apprentices of the Lord Jesus. So their minds are informed with the truth. Their hearts are set ablaze with the love of Christ. They're empowered by the Holy Spirit to live this glorious Christian life as a conqueror, as, as Paul was to say elsewhere that I've already made reference to. And so it's interesting to me that in this one verse, uh, uh, that's Colossians chapter 1 verse 2, what we have in this one verse that very often when we read this epistle, we just pass right over it, don't we? We don't even think about what we're reading. What we see in this one verse is a tour de force from Paul about our identity. It speaks to us uh, in grandiose, sublime terms about the new identities that we receive as those who've been united to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I wanted to home in on this tonight because I think it's really significant indeed. I think identity has always been important, but perhaps it's more important in the particular cultural milieu uh, in which we find ourselves than it has been maybe for many, many years. You see, in the West, we are facing a massive identity crisis. In the West, identity, uh, what it is to be human, what it is to be a, a man or a woman, what it, what it is indeed to be a, a human being, a, a Christian, is being assailed on every level. And there's wholesale confusion wherever we go. And this is making inroads hugely into Western society. It was George Harrison. George Harrison was one of the Beatles. And I remember when he died a few years ago, one of the news channels 
played a quotation from George Harrison over and over again. And Harrison was said to be, wasn't he, uh, the spiritual beetle. And this particular quotation that uh, was played over and over again by the news uh, said this. Harrison said, said this. He said, the purpose of life, he said in his Liverpudlian tones, the purpose of life is to found, find out who am I, uh, where am I going, and what am I doing? That's what we all need answering. That's what Harrison said in the quote. And, and in a succinct way, what Harrison is saying, the purpose of life is to find out our identity, uh, who am I, our, our destiny, where am I going, and our purpose, what is life about. Those are the three things that as human beings we need to know, not just intellectually, but indeed experientially. Those are the things that are going to set us free. And those are three things that the gospel answers in abundance. But we've only got time to think about the issue of identity tonight. Well, from the Christian perspective, human beings, of course, are intended to find their identity in God, their identity in their creator. It was uh, the great Saint Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, who famously prayed this, O oh Lord, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Augustine knew full well that true identity is found in God and is found in God alone. But when God is displaced from the public sphere, as he increasingly is in our post-Christian paradigm, and we back in England, I know the, the project of secularization is much further along the road in England, but my perception is that you guys are not far behind, that some of the inheritance uh, within uh, Northern Ireland, particularly the Bible-based Christian her heritage, has been significantly eroded, hasn't it, in recent years? And uh, Northern Ireland, as the, 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 the province here itself, is showing all the hallmarks of secularization uh, that England and Canada and France and other nations um, have been showing for a number of years. And if we fail to get our identity in God, we get it in something else. And if we get it in something else, that something else is by definition an idol. And so what do we find our identity in? Well, for many of us, it's our work. Some of us, it might be our looks. Uh, for some of us, it might be our brains, our education. I worked at Oxford, and certainly there was a lot of academic hubris there, where some of my fellow lecturers really seem to get their identity in their, in their brain. Uh, some people get their identity in money, the possessions that they own, and some people get their uh, identity in their occupation, what they do. I guess that last one, since most of us work, is perhaps the most common. I remember a story when I was first ordained. I was ordained to a parish in High Wycombe. Anyone, uh, uh, ever, has anyone ever been to High Wycombe? A few people, that's amazing. High Wycombe is a little market town halfway between Oxford and London. I started my curacy there. And there were two young lads in the parish. I was 27 at the time. There were two young guys in the parish who were both 15 called Ziggy and Andy. And Ziggy and Andy were constantly getting into trouble and uh, getting into all kinds of uh, mischief and all this kind of stuff. And uh, uh, on one particular day, Ziggy and Andy knocked on the door of my curate's house, and I said, come in, and in, in the, in, in there came these two lads. And they told me that they'd upgraded their rollerblades. They were really into kind of rollerblading at the time, and they used to rollerblade around the Manor Farm estate in North High Wycombe, where I lived. And I said, great, Ziggy, great, Andy, you know, why are you telling me this? And then in a touching moment, one of them, Ziggy, I think, he got out his old pair of rollerblades, and he said, well, I'd like to give you these. It was, it was a touching gift to the curate. They'd upgraded to a better pair of rollerblades, and so they wanted to give me their old ones. So I said, well, that's very, very kind. Thank you very much. And then Andy said this, well, put them on now. We're going blading now. So I thought, well, you know, I don't want to you know, these kids are hanging on the ch church by a, you know, a, you know, I, I you want to sort of seem as if I'm a little bit with it. Anyway, so I put on these, um, these rollerblades onto my feet, and off we went down the Manor Farm estate. And we were rollerblading down the middle of the road, and I, I was pretty slow. Ziggy and Andy went miles ahead, and, uh, uh, but I was sort of, uh, you know, not really doing very well at all. And then this voice um, 
boomed out from behind me that said this, Oi, you three boys, get off the road. And I turned around, and you can guess, it was, yes, it was the British Bobby. And a uniformed police officer. I wasn't uniformed, thank goodness. And uh, so uh, I immediately hobbled onto the pavement, and Ziggy and Andy stayed exactly where they were. And this police officer, he approached us fastly, um, and I, he, I remember he raised his hand, about to give us a ticking off, obviously, for rollerblading down the middle of the road. And as he raised his hand, Ziggy, age 15, um, pointed to the officer, and then he pointed to me, and then he said, Oi, you can't speak to him like that. He's a vicar. <laughs> so I, uh, uh, as I say, not, not in clericals, age 27, I turned to the officer and I said, Well, vicar, <laughs> just visiting the parish. <laughs> just like that. And... Um, he looked a bit bemused, the police officer. He didn't know whether to believe, believe me or not. And he said, well, Vicar, next time you feel like visiting the parish, maybe you could do it on the pavement. And I said, yes, of course, yes, of course, officer. You know, dutifully deferential. What was Ziggy's mistake? Ziggy's mistake, uh, for one, he felt obviously that clergy were above the law, which clearly isn't the case. But Ziggy's mistake somehow um, was that my identity is, is, is what I do. What I do was so, so all important. You can't speak, speak to him like that. He's a vicar. Um, our identity shouldn't be in what we do, or indeed anything else. I'm not what I do. I am who I am. But that begs the question, uh, doesn't it? Uh, who am I? Well, Paul addresses that question um, amazingly in uh, these, uh, this one verse, Colossians chapter 1, verse 2. To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. The three ways in which Paul uh, addresses these uh, fledgling Christians to remind them of their identity that has changed now that they have become Christians is to say that they are saints, that they are children of God, and they are inhabitants of the divine. Those three things. One, they're saints. Uh, two, they're sons and daughters of God. And three, uh, they're inhabitants of the divine. They're God dwellers. Okay, let's look at uh, each one in turn. So firstly, he tells them that they are saints. Now, in this translation that we're using here, it says to God's holy people. In the King James Version, or the New King James Version, that many of us will be familiar with, Paul writes to the saints in Colossae. And that sometimes confuses people uh, from a Catholic or indeed an Anglican tradition because they look in a stained glass window to see uh, some saint. I was in St. Anne's Cathedral just yesterday in downtown Belfast. And of course, all these amazing saints, uh, uh, basically in the, in the window, those are those, the, 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 the saints depicted in these stained glass windows. Well, biblically speaking, a saint isn't someone who's been canonized. A saint is simply someone who has been sanctified, somebody who's given their life to Jesus Christ. All Christians are saints. And saints literally means called out ones or holy ones. So that's the first thing that Paul says to these uh, fledgling Christians. He calls them saints. Their identity has changed. They're no longer sinners, um, but they are saints. Their nature has been made new at the ordination service uh, in Down Cathedral on Sunday. We had a reading from uh, Corinthians where Paul says, you are a new creation, he says to the Corinthian church. The old has gone, the new has come. You are men and women made new. And yet so many Christians I know persist uh, with the idea that our identity is that of being a sinner. I, I went to a leaders' gathering in England a few years ago, and this gathering was uh, for, for kind of uh, uh, senior leaders. There were people there who were running denominations, evangelists, all, all kinds of individuals there. And then we had to split up into, into small groups to pray together and to discuss the content. And I was in this particular small group, and there was uh, a, a, a senior leader who was to my left, and he kicked off first, and he said to people, he, sa he said, uh, he said this, I'm a filthy, rotten sinner. That's what he said to his fellow leaders. I'm a filthy, rotten sinner. And I couldn't help myself. It just, I just spoke without thinking. And I just said, well, speak for yourself. Uh, like this. And he was, he, was, he was surprised. And the reason I said speak for, 
yourself. It's not that I do not sin. I'm not, of course, I'm not saying that we attain perfection uh, in this life. Um, well, um, by uh, obedience to Jesus Christ, by obedience to his word, um, by appropriating the Holy Spirit, we sin less. We don't necessarily become sinless in experiential terms. But it's important that we accept that our identity has changed. We're no longer in our identity uh, sinners, but we are, in fact, saints. Why is that important? It's important because if we think of ourselves as sinners, filthy, rotten sinners, we shouldn't be surprised if we act like filthy, rotten sinners. And if we think of ourselves, as we should biblically, as saints who occasionally sin, sometimes sin, but saints who occasionally sin, then we shouldn't be surprised if by the grace and power of God's indwelling Holy Spirit, little by little, bit by bit, we begin to live holy lives. We begin to look like the holy God we serve, Jesus Christ, who is, of course, the holy and righteous one. Okay, the second uh, identity in this passage that Paul mentions is that of being a child. So a saint is number one. The second one is being a child, namely being a son or a daughter of God. And we've got it there at the end of verse two, haven't we? Where Paul says, grace and peace to you from God, our father. These are brothers and sisters because if God is your father and God is my father, that makes us spiritual siblings. But God is our father. It was Jesus, of course, uh, who radically introduced the phrase Abba to Jewish discourse. Abba, the Aramaic familial word for father. Was it, isn't, isn't even the stiff and starchy English word father that we use. It was the familial intimate word for father. And uh, the ordinance and I, we were looking at the Lord's Prayer. We had uh, about six hours just to look at the five verses of the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus tells his disciples to, to pray, uh, Heavenly Dad, Abba, uh, that Aramaic word, Heavenly Papa. So God is our Father, and we are his sons and his daughters by adoption. That is, if we've given our life uh, to Jesus Christ. King Charles has uh, been crowned now. Obviously, he, he um, ascended to the throne upon uh, the death of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, but his coronation um, was in recent months in Westminster Abbey. And Charles, of course, inherits all the kind of monarchical titles that his mother had. Here's a few of them. Charles III, by the grace of God, uh, King of Great Britain, and Northern Ireland, and all the other realms and territories of the Commonwealth. Charles III, by the grace of God, um, uh, King of Canada, um, and the other realms and territories. Head of the Commonwealth, uh, King, the Charles, King Charles, defender of the faith, that German phrase, Eich Dean. Uh, Charles III, by the grace um, of God, um, uh, King of his uh, various realms, um, and territories, and uh, in charge of the royal order of the Garter, Charles III, supreme governor, not the head, uh, the, the, even the media uh, get that confused, the supreme governor of the Church of England. He has all these amazing titles. The list goes on and on. But to William and Harry, obviously I realized uh, there are complications in his relationship with his youngest boy at the moment, but to William and Harry, he's simply pa. That's their pa is the familial term that William and indeed Harry use for their dad, King Charles III. Well, for God, there's all kinds of terms that we can use to describe him. We Anglicans, we love the austerity, don't we, of almighty God. And that's legitimate. Uh, the Hebrew, uh, one of the Hebrew phrase, uh, terms, El Shaddai, almighty and all-powerful God, there's lots of different Hebrew terms uh, for God, um, are there not? And then there's Jesus, is, God is the king of kings. He's the alpha and the omega. Um, he's the one who stung the very, flung the very stars into space. But actually for the Christian man or woman, those who have called on the name of the Lord Jesus, he is Abba. He is our heavenly dad. Um, God 
has brought us into an intimate relationship with himself through the blood of Jesus. Now, you might be thinking that uh, this term for God as Father, let alone Abba or Heavenly Dad, is problematic. The Archbishop of York flagged that up recently. I don't know whether you saw in the news that uh, he was speaking at General Synod on the Lord's Prayer and said that this was problematic in the fatherless generation in which we live. We, the first pandemic wasn't uh, COVID-19, but actually the, 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 the first pandemic in the West, in, in Britain, is the pandemic of fatherlessness. And some people think, well, because of that, people can't relate to uh, God as father. So maybe we need to jettison the term. I would say, as someone who's not known his earthly dad, uh, I would say the exact opposite. My own experience was that I grew up in a single parent family. My dad uh, left when I was three years of age. And because my dad struggled with alcoholism, he wasn't allowed custody. And so actually, uh, me and my two siblings, we grew up in the northwest of England in Lancashire, not knowing our dad. Um, but I always thought in my mind, I'm going to go and look him up. When I'm 18, one day, I'm going to go and look him up. And then one day, uh, there was a knock on the door. I was 17 years of age. I didn't recognize the lady. Uh, the lady, it turns out, was my dad's sister, my Auntie Mary. And she came through to say, uh, I'm sorry to tell you that John, my father, died. Died suddenly of a heart attack, age 51. And so really, I would come into that category where there is a kind of dad-shaped gap in my own life, and certainly in my own years uh, growing up, in my late teens, even in my 20s, I struggled with different issues to do with identity, I'm sure, because of this deficit of knowing um, my dad that was in my life. Then there was one particular day at Theological College, I remember I was training at Wycliffe Hall, Oxford, where I later went on to be a lecturer, and someone was praying for me, and the Spirit of God fell upon me, and I somewhat embarrassingly fell to the ground. It was kind of slightly awkward. There I was in the lower common room of the Theological College, feeling slightly self-conscious, uh, shaking under the power of the Holy Spirit as I was lying on the carpet. And as I was lying there, I was still conscious, and I asked the Lord this question. I said, God, what are you doing? And I'll never forget his answer. I sense God say, I'm applying my fatherhood to the deepest level of your being. God, by his Holy Spirit, was applying the fatherhood of God to the deepest level of my being. And that was the beginning, I think, of a healing journey um, in my own life. Spiritual adoption, says J.I. Packer, the, theolo the theologian Jim Packer, spiritual adoption is the greatest blessing of the gospel. And yet we live in a society where whether you're rich or poor, there are many who are struggling with issues to do with uh, fatherlessness. I was one of them. And it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, whether you're working class or aristocratic, it's still the same. Look at uh, the royal family. I don't know whether any of you read uh, Spare when it came out. Spare was Prince Harry's best-selling autobiography. Okay, put your hand up if you read Spare. Basically, nobody in the room. Do you know... It's, it's not just in Northern Ireland. When I go around England, I say, who's read Spare? No hands go up. Uh, so I think people, you know, either it didn't sell as well as the publishers reckon it did, or, or people maybe are slightly embarrassed to admit it. Well, I read it unashamedly, and I believe that Spare is the orphan spirit in narrative form. The orphan spirit, the spirit of fatherlessness in narrative form. So if you're a preacher, particularly, and you want to tune in with where society is, I'd recommend you buy a copy of Spare. I think they're about 50p on Amazon now, so <laughs> fairly cheap. Anyway, here's a little quotation. Here's a little quotation from Spare. This is Prince Harry speaking. He said, I, this is Harry. He said, I heard the story of what Pa allegedly said to Mummy the day of my worth, birth. Wonderful. Uh, now you've given me an heir and a spare. My work is done. That's what, apparently what uh, uh, King Charles, as he is now, said. Uh, spare, this is Harry speaking, there was no judgment about it, but also no ambigu ambiguity. I was the shadow, the support, the plan B. I was brought into the world in case something happened to William. I was summoned to provide backup, distraction, diversion, and if necessary, a spare part. Kidney, perhaps, blood transfusion, speck of bone marrow. This was all made explicitly clear to me from the start of life's journey 
and regularly reinforced. Can you not feel the kind of orphan spirit in those, in those words that Harry felt right from the get-go, that he didn't belong, he didn't matter, uh, he had no purpose in life apart from simply to be the spare? Well, the good news is, if you belong to Jesus Christ tonight, you're never the spare, but you're always the heir. Because that's what the Bible says we are. The Bible says we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Jesus becomes our brother when God becomes our father, even though he's the son of God by nature, by ontology, and we are the sons and daughters of God by adoption. We get what he has. And that's amazing news. That should uh, literally blow our minds. Let me share a story. I, I go and have coffee in Coffee One. Uh, it's my favorite coffee shop in, um, uh, in Whitney, just near Oxford, where I live. And uh, about a year ago, I was in Coffee One. I got chatting to one of the barristers. Uh, no, sorry, baristas. I always pronounce that wrong. <laughs> one of the baristas. Um, they, are, they always get delusions of grandeur when I speak to them. Anyway, one of the baristas, and, he, and this guy's name was Matthew. And I asked Matthew, did he believe in God? And Matthew said, well, there must be something there. And I said to him, you're an agnostic. And he said, am I? And I said, yeah. You know, you, you, kind of, you say there must be something there. And I said, Matthew, why, why don't you pray with me the agnostic's prayer? He said, what's that? I said, it simply goes like this. God, if you exist, make yourself known to me. He said, all right then. So, I, so we basically said, it's, you know, I led him in the prayer. God, if you exist, make yourself known to me. At that point, I believe the Lord gave me a, a kind of like a word of knowledge, like a prophetic word for Matthew. And I said to him this. I said, Matthew... I get a, a sense that you're struggling to prove yourself to your dad. Uh, you're, you're, you're struggling to gain his approval, but it's too late. Matthew's eyes filled up with tears, and he said, that was quick. And I said, uh, what do you mean that was quick? And he said, well, God's just made himself known to me. And he said, well, I said, what do you mean? And he said, my dad's dead. He said, but I chose my course at Oxford. He was a student at Oxford down the road. He said, precisely, not because I wanted to do it, because I thought that what, that's what my dad wanted me to do. Even though my dad's dead, I'm trying to, in, 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 in his, you know, he's not, no longer with us, I'm trying to prove myself to him, and it's too, it's too late, as you said. And so I shared the gospel, more of the gospel with Matthew, and it was my privilege to lead him to Christ there and then in the coffee shop. And um, he messaged me just a few weeks ago. This is over a, over a year ago now, maybe a year and a half ago. And he messaged me a few weeks ago, and he said this. He said, Greg, since our first conversation, I've never forgotten it, how powerful and shocking it was. That's what he says, how powerful and shocking it was. I truly do believe in God. And since reading that book you gave me, I gave him a Bible and a, a spiritual book to, to help disciple him. He said, since reading that book you gave me, I've wanted to live a life that is more moral and pray as well to show my gratitude and appreciation for life and love to others. I want you to know that my life changed the day of our meeting. Life is better when you allow God into your heart. Isn't that amazing? That's a year or 18 months uh, later. Matthew came to know God as his father. Okay, but the third and final uh, thing to do with identity is inhabitant. Inhabitant of the divine, I said, or a God dweller. And uh, Paul refers to this amazing concept in his unique phrase that he uses again and again, not just in this epistle, but in other epistles as well, when he speaks about the Christians, the, the, the believers in Jesus Christ, being in Christ. Notice, to, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, if we can uh, flick on um, the next uh, slide, John, and actually we'll go on to this one, this, uh, one uh, the one here to do with uh, uh, the physical address. Your spiritual address is more important than your physical address. Where you live spiritually is more important than where you inhabit materially. So to God's holy people in Colossae, the unimportant town, that's William Barclay's phrase, for what Colossae was viewed as in the ancient world, in modern-day Turkey. To God's holy people in Colossae, that's juxtaposed with the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. And the same thing is relevant today. It's almost as if God would say to us today, to God's holy people in Northern Ireland, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. We have a new habitation when we give our lives to God in Jesus Christ and that is we indwell 
God. God indwells us by his spirit, but we indwell the divine. We are in Christ. The reformer Martin Luther knew this well. He famously said, if I think of myself apart from Christ, even for a moment, I am undone. So in conclusion, my encouragement to each one of us tonight, if we are Christians, to remember, of course, that we have uh, a, a new, uh, we have a new uh, identity in those uh, threefold uh, ways that I've been uh, speaking about earlier. Yes, of course, we're a saint. Uh, we are made holy because of the blood of, of Jesus. We are sons or daughters of the living God. But also, we have this new address, this new spiritual address. And so I would exhort you, remember where you live, that you are in Christ. Because it seems to me that many of us struggle from spiritual amnesia. I was just talking to someone the other day who was doubting uh, their identity in God. They were doubting God's goodness. They were even having doubts about God himself. They were being buffeted all over the place. And I exhorted them to remember that they were in Christ. And I actually shared a different bit of uh, Luther advice because Luther, when he used to doubt, he used to beat his chest. Luther, of course, was a bit of thespian. I'm sure we all know that. Luther used to beat his chest and he used to say, I have been baptized. I have been baptized. I have been baptized. And I said to this person, I said, you know, when you're, you could do the same. You could beat your chest and say, I've been baptized. Or I am a Christian. I am a Christian. I am a Christian. Declare it uh, out like a, like a creed like a statement of faith. Remember where you live because the enemy um, of, uh, of who we are, the enemy of our souls, would love to draw us into spiritual amnesia. A final story. I used to work in a, a prison after my curacy uh, in Bristol. And um, when I worked in the prison, um, obviously all kinds of things were contraband for security reasons. And uh, one day, when I first started as a chaplain, I innocently took a pair of scissors in my briefcase into, yes, yeah, I know it's stupid, isn't it, into the prison, and my office was off the prison chapel, uh, which, you know, loads of inmates, loads of young offenders used to, to go into there, and, you know, right next to my office. And, um, and one day, there was, a, there was a bit of a raid from the, sec the security guards, and they said, Padre, chaplain, sorry, we confiscated your scissors. And they told me off. They didn't tell me off too much, but they told me off and said, you're not allowed scissors in here. Anyway, scissors were really useful because sometimes if I was writing a letter to somebody, and like the bishop, and it was only uh, half a page, what I do with the scissors, of course, is cut a line. And I found a way around it because I didn't have any scissors anymore. The uh, security guard would nick my scissors. So if I was writing a, a short letter, what I'd do is fold the letter in half and uh, I'd uh, lick it along the side uh, like that and fold it the other way and lick it the other side. And then what I found is even without the scissors, look, it works. I managed to uh, get a, a pretty, a pretty uh, decent letter. Yeah, thanks very much. Anyway, so I left. I left. I left the prison, and the job that I did after my prison, I went to be a seminary professor. It was my first job at London School of Theology, uh, London Bible College, it used to be called. That's uh, London School of Theology there on the right-hand side. And there was one particular day I was in my office as a seminary lecturer. I was the tutor in evangelism um, in, in London, uh, just outside London. And I was writing a letter to someone, and uh, I don't know who it was, but uh, I needed a short letter and not a big letter. And so I folded it in half. And I uh, licked down the side, and then I licked down the side like this. And then I opened the drawer, and of course, there were the scissors. And I thought, I'm not in prison anymore. Brothers and sisters, we need to celebrate the truth that we have been redeemed. We're not in prison anymore. We've had a change of address. And now, gloriously, because of Jesus Christ, we've been brought close to God. Uh, we've been made his sons and his daughters by adoption. He sees us as saints and we're called to dwell within him, our new spiritual address. We are in Christ. I'm going to ask uh, our musicians if they'll uh, come forward uh, at this point. I think we've got another uh, song. Uh, so if our musicians would like to come forward. I'm going to respond now uh, to the Lord uh, in, in worship. And uh, what I want to flag up is uh, just one or two things when I was praying about this of uh, issues that you might want to 
bring before the Lord in prayer. Because when God's word is preached, when God's word is expounded, it's not just an intellectual thing. It's supposed to be uh, that God applies the truth to our hearts by his Holy Spirit. And transformation, change is brought about. So we've been thinking about this very important issue of identity uh, tonight. And so one or two things that might be relevant. You could, um, in a moment when we respond to worship, you could just stay where you are and uh, do business with God as we're worshiping the Lord in song. But also there's going to be a prayer ministry team available. So if you want to come forward, somebody would be delighted to pray with you and for you. And there's going to be a prayer ministry team around at the formal end of the service uh, shortly. And uh, one or two things that came to uh, mind was, was this. I got, got a sense that, uh, the, that this is relevant to, uh, I think, more than one person here, is that the enemy is having a field day with your mind and uh, basically causing you to beat yourself up, thinking that you know, I'm no good, uh, maybe a bit like that senior minister who said, you know, I'm a filthy, rotten sinner, I'm a worm and no man, you know, being the old covenant and not new covenant, of thinking yourself as basically a load of rubbish and uh, as, a, as a failure. Well, I uh, would encourage you to get prayer tonight. There's that wonderful verse where it says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the re renewing of your mind. The battle is for the mind. And certainly that's been my own experience, that as I've received prayer ministry, there's been a transformation of my mindset, which has led to me m more walking in the victory that Christ intends uh, for me. Uh, the other one, which is to do with this last one about your position, which is in Christ. Um, that uh, I really got a sense that that really resonated for some people, that thing of spiritual amnesia, of basically uh, forgetting that you now live uh, in Christ, that you've had a change of address. And so maybe prayer for you is that God might break off spiritual amnesia in you. And like Luther, you might practice the presence of God. There's an amazing book by Brother Lawrence, The Practice of the Presence of God, that you remember uh, that you might remember that you are his. And that's really key for identity because when it comes to identity, the key to finding out who you are is remembering whose you are. And you belong to Jesus Christ if you've given your life to him. The, the third thing, and it's a bit of a biggie, is this thing of uh, the fatherhood of God. The fatherhood of God. And, and I'm sure there are people here, perhaps like me, who've experienced a deficit in terms of uh, of, of, uh, of fatherhood, biological fatherhood in your own life. And maybe because of that, you're still struggling in all kinds of ways. My encouragement for you, if what I've said tonight has stirred that up in some way, that actually you receive prayer and uh, someone will be delighted to pray uh, for you. I, I, that, that phrase that the Lord said to me all those years ago, I still use it today when I'm praying for brothers and sisters to have a, a fresh revelation of the fatherhood of God. Uh, I say, Father, reveal your fatherhood, apply your fatherhood to the deepest level of uh, your being. And the fourth one is, uh, the fourth one simply is this, and I, wa I wasn't intending to do this uh, tonight, but um, uh, this is only night one, isn't it, of the Bible week, and the Bible week obviously primarily is for those who are Christians. These are Bible expositions that we are uh, hearing, but I'm an evangelist, and I always preach with a missional edge, even when I'm doing expository preaching, and my experience is often there are seekers, people on the fringes, uh, in our churches, uh, all over the place. There were three people on Sunday in the cathedral that made a profession of faith, it seems, perhaps for the first time, to receive uh, Christ as I threw the net out. And so I feel it would be right to do that tonight. And I'm going to conclude with a prayer. Let me read it for you. And this is a prayer that you can pray if you want to perhaps become a Christian, a follower of Jesus for the first time. It goes like this, Abba, the Aramaic word for heavenly dad. Abba, uh, Abba, heavenly dad, I turn from my sin, that's everything I've done wrong, said wrong, thought wrong, to your son, that's Jesus Christ. I receive the adoption you offer and I become your child. Fill me with your spirit, your Holy Spirit, and help me follow you now and always. I'm going to pray that prayer in conclusion. And I would invite uh, anyone, let's just bow our heads uh, together, shall we? And I would invite anyone who wants to become a follower of Jesus for the first time, to pray this prayer tonight as your way of giving your life to Jesus. You don't have to speak it out loud, just as I pause at the end of each line. Uh, make it your own prayer. This would be relevant for you as well if you've perhaps given your life to Christ weeks, months, maybe years ago, but you know you're, you're not actively following 
Jesus Christ at the moment. So here's the prayer. But one more thing, just before I pray, I'm going to invite you to do something a little bit brave. And that's as we've got our heads bowed, as an indication of your do, you're doing this, I'd like you to just raise your right hand just where you are so I can see. It's good to take a step of faith. The Christian life is by faith. So it's good to start as we mean to go on. And it would be a good indication that you're, that you're doing that. So just raise your right hand just where you are if you're praying this prayer, either for the first time to become a follower of Jesus or as a, a recommitment uh, to him uh, to give your life uh, over to him. Okay, thank you. You can put your hands, hands down. So this is uh, for the five of you. Uh, there may have been more, but I saw five people. This is for you five. It could be for anyone else. If you didn't put your hand up, but you really want to pray this prayer, then do. So it goes like this. Uh, Abba, Heavenly Dad, I turn from my sin to your son. I receive the adoption you offer and I become your child. Fill me with your spirit. Help me follow you now and always. Amen. And I'd encourage you, those of you that I saw, do come and speak to me afterwards or indeed uh, uh, Bishop David or someone else here to say that I've prayed that prayer. It'd be good for us perhaps to uh, give you some tips if, if you're getting just started in the Christian life and maybe pray, pray for you personally. But uh, just as I hand over to the worship team for a final song, here's a prayer. Uh, let's stand and here's a prayer for each one of us. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for the identity that we have in you. We thank you that we are men and women made new. And uh, we thank you, Lord, in this uh, time of great confusion of uh, identity where people are asking, who am I, that you've given us new a new identity uh, in being followers of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you've made us saints, uh, ones who are holy. That's our identity. Uh, may we live like that more and more as we choose a life of obedience. Thank you that you've made us your children, sons and daughters by adoption. And Lord, give us an experiential revelation of your fatherhood that might, we might know that you are our heavenly dad and may that bring healing uh, to us on our journey wherever we are and thank you for that position that you've given us that change of address thank you lord that we are inhabitants of you the divine we are uh, god dwellers that we are in christ jesus and may we never forget that banish spirit spiritual amnesia off each one of us and like luther may we remember uh, whose we are that key to knowing who we are is knowing whose we are we belong to you and nothing but nothing can, can take us from that place uh, lord pour your holy spirit upon us now apply your word to our hearts and bring healing hope transformation we pray in jesus name amen